Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 148 for Monday, January 8th, 2018. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about weekend warriors. That's us working musicians. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. How goes it, man? It goes good, man. Good. Here we are, early January. The whole year is laid out before us and uh, figuring out gigs and, and bookings and, you know, been really hard at work as we go back to the beginning of the year. Yeah, so you, you know, you're the, uh, you're the one here of the two of us, I mean. Uh, you're the one that does the, the hard work of booking all the gigs. Um, although I've done some of that recently, it, it, you know, some of it falls into my lap occasionally, but I don't, yep. I don't go out and do it. So I, you're looking at the, the summer, how, how much have you booked of the summer? Like where in that process are you right now? Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, my tact, my kind of formula is I always, as we conclude a gig, you know, and remember there's the year long relationships with, with club venues, right? That's, that's ongoing, of course. but the busy season for us, which is May to September and all those outdoor things, you know, that we do, um, I have like a couple step process to it and it's, you know, it's not rocket science, but so immediately upon finishing a gig, I'll tell the booking person is almost always at the event. Hey, you have first shot at your same date for next year. If you want to rebook it. And then I will send a note kind of at the end of August to everybody that says, you know, just a reminder, existing clients get first choice at rebooking, you know, before I start, soliciting new business, you know, new, new gigs, but you get until the end of, let's just say October. Sure. And so, you know, kind of like just work my pool of people. And, and then, you know, I, in the meantime, I'm kind of creating a bullpen of gigs I want to go after. Sure. And, you know, then October 1st usually is when I just kind of open it up and just kind of start going after gigs and anybody who hasn't rebooked, you know, hopefully there'll be a spot for them. Yep. But, you know, this is why scarcity, I think, is the booker's best friend. I mean, being in demand changes the nature of your discussion. Like until you get to that point, I totally get it. You're, you know, you're fighting to fill your calendar. You're fighting to you know, get gigs. It's not easy. You know, yep. it's not what it once was. But, you know, my I, I value scarcity. So I'm, I, I might there's very few gigs that I'll punt, uh, you know, on the interest that I might be able to get a better paying gig sure. later. And a lot of people take that tack. Like, you know, I want to keep my options open because I want to be able to choose the best paying gig at any one time. Yeah. But you know, it's pretty there's, competitive yeah, for the types of gigs I'm going after. That. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's it. You know, I kind of like offer a rebook opportunity right there at the gig. Yeah. Sometimes they take it. Sometimes they're like, no, we got to go talk about it. Got a committee. You know, there's lots of reasons yeah, why of they course. won't do it at that time. And then uh, some do book uh, for the following summer, some do book in the fall. Uh, this year has been an interesting year. I'm about five to seven gigs behind bookings that I was last year. And almost uniformly, it's people saying, nope, we've decided we're not going to make any decisions until, you know, it, it, like uh, there's a subtle change. And remember, there's a lot of uh, uh, variable. Sometimes there's a new booking person or yep. there's a new committee and, you know, whatever it might be. And so, uh, you know, January and February are going to be the big busy times. Big, okay. And so, yeah. So, you know, we've got our X amount of clubs and a couple private gigs that get us from January to May. And where, so you asked the question, where am I? I mean, we already have, you know, three to five a month in, in, uh, in, in June, July, August, September. So wow. we're, we're, we're off to a good start. I always panic. You know, I am always like, this is the year all of those regular customers are going to say, no, nah, it's time to rotate, get some new people. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I worry that like 20 of those people are going to do that in one year. But, you know, I always try to keep the options open and, and, um, you know, like I've said, I've got this bullpen of new gigs to go after anticipating that that's going to happen sooner or later. We've had, we have a handful of really loyal, you know, they, they've been with us 10, 10 plus years, just the rebook is almost automatic, which is just a great thing. 
but you know, there's so many variables that change. You know, we're talking about my buddy's band Sage, which which had a lot of gigs, and they were kind of the only other really great horn band in this area. Right. I talked about this really famous guy in our area, Joe Shrino. Uh, Joe retired this year as well, and so you know that leaves a little bit of a hole. There's always new bands coming up, new so, bands. Yeah, you know, we're trying to knocks. demonstrate credibility. Yeah. yeah. So you know, may, maybe we'll walk into some of those great gigs that Sage and Shrino had. I sure hope. Um, you know, we're kind of at that point now. This is going to be our 19th year. You know, we're established and we're known. We have a good reputation. You know, we have good references. You know, we should be able to 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 take another step forward in terms of first call for, at least in my geographic area, first call for, like if somebody wants to do a fundraiser yeah. or some big thing and they want a known entity, hopefully we will be that. So and, uh, I, I, you, you can't, there's two things about this I want to, I want to dig into a little bit. The The first is, you know, you create scarcity. I mean, some of it is is real, right? That, that, you know, you're a popular band. You always deliver. You've been around for a long time and you're already getting booked. Right. I mean, like you said, your summer, you've already got 15 gigs or whatever booked for the summer, which, you know, for some bands is more than they want. So that's great. Um, but part of it is just in the way that you present yourself, right? Like when you said, hey, you get right of first refusal for your date next year. Like you might not even think about the fact that by saying that you are implying very subtly and very tactfully yeah. this artificial, not potentially artificial scarcity, right? Certainly at the time it's artificial because no one's right there saying I want it too, right? But it implies someone will take it if you don't. It, it implies that without being aggressive or any right. of that, right? And I, and that's a huge thing it, to, to, to have the confidence. And sometimes it's, I mean, it, it, I don't mean to take anything away from what you've done with the cal- house rockers, but in, in sales in general, sometimes Sometimes you have to fabricate that confidence inside yourself and then just communicate it. And, and then it, it does become reality. So, well, let's, 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 let's unpack that a little bit. So remember there's, there's no fabrication involved. I, what I I'm know. saying is absolutely true. No, no, no. You have I'm just first saying, choice on this date. I'm saying in general for anybody that's doing this, not, not you in particular, but, but yes, I mean, it, it you have the confidence to say that whereas somebody who who's doing this for the first time might feel like they don't have the confidence to say that. And, and, and my point is pretend like you do anyway, just yeah. be comfortable about it. Yeah. That's yeah. It. yeah. And that's a, a bit of an experience thing Yep. for a lot of the guys who listen to the show and they probably have day jobs and, you know, and I'm going to imagine, you know, there's this big surge and kind of like entrepreneurs and executives, you know, retaking up music as kind of a, as a kind of a hobby type thing, you know, they're used to doing business. And so, you know, yes. I, However, there is a little thing where you're used to doing your business. And when you do the band stuff, sometimes you apply your business skills. Sometimes you think it's a totally different thing. It's not a totally different thing. It's exactly I mean, the same. <laughs> good communication is good communication. Yep. You know, concise, no, what, clear. I mean, when you said you write a first refusal for your slot next year, the, like I literally have used that phrase. And, and so have my sales reps at Backbeat Media with, you know, with doing things just like that. But it has nothing to do with booking a band. You know, it's yeah, it's, it's just it's, a useful it's. Yeah. And it again, like you said, it's not false, but it it implies a uh, that that there is other interest. It communicates that there is other interest, whether or not there actually is, is. Well, well I mean, you can also yeah. even if you're not comfortable with that, I mean, the statement holds up on itself. You never know what will happen. Right. You know, it, if totally you want to remove true. chance, if you want to remove chance from the conversation, you know, let's just book and let's just get it done. And you made a comment about. um uh presenting an idea with confidence and, and, you know, every booking contact is different. And this is why confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Every booking contact is different. Your relationships are different. Sometimes people have authority and they can make a decision. Sometimes people are the front end of a quote unquote committee that's deciding on something. Sometimes people react well to, Hey, this is just a business discussion. I've got something, you know, you, you need something. I've got something. Let's talk. You know, that's, that's, most business people are comfortable with that frame, but you know, a lot of those civic concerts that we do, it's like a park and rec department. And sometimes yeah. it could be, you know, a really junior, you know, administrative person and it's, you know, they're not a business person. And so too much pressure can definitely, you know, put someone on edge that way. So this is why it's just so important to kind of understand who you're talking to and, uh, and have a tone, you know, that, 
again, we've talked many times about how everything you do represents your band. Yep. Do you want to be that pushy guy with the pushy band? Because the assumption is they're pushy and, you know, what are they hiding? You know, there are a lot of things that can be read into overt, uncalled for pushiness. Like, yeah, you, know, like yeah you don't to, right. You don't want to come across the wrong way to the wrong person for sure. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, to, to draw it out all the way to the end, you know, when we used to book like big bands for MacWorld shows, and I would have to deal with booking entities who do this all day. This is their living. This is their livelihood, and it's their pro level. So you know, right. remember at MacWorld we had we had Little Feet, we had Cheap Trick, we had Devo, we had we had some really interesting bands that, that performed at the trade show, and uh, you know. I would say that the tone of booking entertainment, um, those people, there's definitely, it's got its own kind of laid back, like, you know, Hey, you know, I'm not trying to sell you sugar water for the rest of your life. Right. Right. You know, this is a cool thing that we're here to talk about, but it's direct. I mean, it, it is like, Hey, you know, and there's gotta be money on the table. Yeah. There's gotta be right. Yeah. yeah. Is yeah. it, are we real, you know, oh, and yes. you know, can you pay? So kind of those basic, you know, what are the, um, what do they say the objections, uh, handling objections are when you're a salesperson? Like you have to qualify whether the person you're talking to, yeah. do they have the ability to make a decision? Do they have the money to make a decision? Do they believe that you can deliver what you say you're going to deliver? That's so those true. three things are huge. So, huge. you know, yep. that that's sales of any kind. And when we narrow it down to sales, you know, for selling a booking types of things, you know, if the person doesn't believe that you're oh, a good band. Forget it. Yeah. You're never going to get to the next step. Well, right. And, and, and then and the, 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 the precursor to that is that if you don't believe that you are mm. a good band or don't believe you're worth what you're asking or don't believe like if, like if somebody's trying to get into this, you know, festival circuit, like you're talking about and they feel like, wow, we're just the new guys and all these other bands are, you know, established. If you go in with that mindset, you will communicate that whether you think yeah. you're going to or not without a doubt, you will. And then the other person, you know, doesn't have that confidence. It's that comfortable confidence that you need to come in shoulders dropped, but standing tall. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm using that as a metaphor as much as, as, as a, you know, an actual thing, if you're talking to somebody in front of them, but it's that kind of thing. Like, Nope, here I am. I've got this great thing. Uh, I have no doubt that it's exactly uh, going to work great for you. And I'd love to work out a deal like that. Yep. That needs to be the mindset. And it's it's that comfortable so confidence true. that that that's not cockiness. Right. Because that comes across as a lack of confidence, the cockiness, you know. Yeah. And to kind of pull all this together, it's like if you've done your work and your band is rehearsed and your band is good and your band is ready to that fact stands whether or not you have other bookings. Right. Mm -hmm. You can confidently, comfortably, honestly say I've got a great band and here's what we do and here's why we're different. And you can say all those things. Then when you add the layer of, and we're kind of in demand, you know, we're, you know, our dates go pretty well. So let, let's, let's talk now and, you know, let, let's see if we can arrange something that, that you get to layer on. But you, you, what you're saying is confidence in presenting whatever you do, but certainly in presenting a band for booking is, is, Absolutely necessary. You Absolutely. have to have your wrap down. You have to be able to talk about why you're different. You have to be able to talk about, you know, and you have to be able to show them with a demo because they'll want to listen to you. And so you'll have to be able to show them video or audio that you are good. Yeah. And so that's the first part. And you have to be, you know, if you want to pitch your band for gigs, you have to have that wrap down and be very comfortable. But the point I'm making is that fact of your band being good. Often when you're starting out and you're not so comfortable and you don't have gigs and you need a gig. So, you know, the, you know that creates leverage in the other way. When yep. someone else has something you absolutely need, you are you know tend to be a little bit more... It's negative you know, leverage. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, but it, the best help we can give people listening is if you've done your work and you're good, that stands aside from whether you have gigs. And then, so that, so your, or, your or asset... whether you have 10 years of history or any of that. It's just, if your band's good, your band's good. Like right. that's, that's one checkbox. You got it covered. Yep. That's right. And then if you can say we have, you know, history and performance, that's just another benefit that you can offer. Yep. And then if you can say we're, you know, pretty book, booked up, that creates leverage in your way. And so then you get to, you know, kind of use those as additional selling points in order to get your point across. So, so and I, you know, this is always fun when we do this because this is kind of like sales 101. And again, a lot of guys out there or women out there are, 
are probably in the business world and, you know, their band is their weekend, you know, deal and, you know, they're comfortable with these concepts, but I'm always interested in, you know, I work with 10 guys, you know, in one band and, you know, several people in other projects. It's interesting to me how not business people approach these problems. Yes. You know, how, how uncomfortable they can be about it or how much they think they're good at it. When I listen to their, their pitch and they are not good at it, right? <laughs> but it, you know what, what, and what people do is they tend to gravitate to a comfort zone, right? Right. You know, you tend to, if something works once, you like to think about that thing that worked once as opposed to the nine things that didn't work. And what can you learn from those nine other things that yeah, you did? Totally. Right. But, but um, yeah, the, you know, this, this is kind of sales one-on-one. What do you have to sell? What is unique? What is, what are your strengths? Play up the strengths. Um, don't go, don't go to where the weaknesses are, but have an, have an answer. If someone says, well, if you're so great, why haven't you worked so much? And just say, Hey, we're, you you know, we're new, we're answer. on the circuit. Comfortable yeah, have confidence. an answer. That's it. Yep. That's so, it. Comfortable um, confidence. The the um the next thing I want to dig into here with this is you know, like you said, you've been dealing with like a lot of these places, you know, you've playing played there for years, sometimes even, you know, double digit years. And that's a great thing, and they get on autopilot. And again, kind of sales 101 type of stuff. Maybe this is sales 201 at this point. When you've got something on autopilot. Where you need to be really careful is a assuming that you just have that money like your your concern over maybe this is the year that it all all of them fall apart. Well, one of them probably falls apart every year, but, but you know, all of them, it's not going to happen, but it's good to be aware that it could. Right. Mm. So that you're not getting too complacent about it. But Stay humble, my friends. That's it. But. Where it really gets interesting is when you get a new booking agent or a new booking contact, I'll say, that's inserted into this autopilot process, because that's when things can really fall apart, because you'll show up and say, hey, let's do this like we always have. And the thing to remember is that you've got a new person that's in charge of this little thing, like this is their sphere of control now. Yeah. And you have to find a way to get exactly what you want out of them without uh, making them feel like they're just inheriting what the last person left. Because in invariably, when you take over a job like that, you're going to look at it and you're going to I mean, sometimes it's wow, the person before me did a great job. He or she just retired. I hope I can do as well as them. Sometimes that happens. That makes life easy. But yep. sometimes it's you step into it and, you know, somebody digs into all the stuff. It's like, dude, this is a mess. They didn't keep records. They weren't organized. And suddenly every decision that this previous person made is now far more suspect than it actually really needs to be. And so when you show up and you say, yeah, but, you know, when Timmy was here, we just did things, these things this way. Bad. You have no idea what baggage Bad, yeah. you just brought with you. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you just I, I always and, and we again, this is, you know, sales 201 when when we are dealing with somebody that's coming into a thing and it doesn't matter if it's a band or, you know, your business or whatever, you, you like find a way to, to be. And oftentimes it's as simple as saying, hey, uh, I realize you're new here. This is great. We've been doing this for years. But what I'd really like to do is sit down figure out with you what works for you and the way you want to do things and how, so we can, how we can be a part of that. And if you get in on that early enough in the process, now you're like a trusted advisor for this person. That's it. You That's know? so smart. Yep. So you just, yeah, gotta, I, I would, I would go a little further. Right yep. Yeah. And the one asset you have in that conversation is like, Hey, we're so excited to have you, you know, as our new contact, um, you know, we've had this long, great relationship with your organization that we would love to continue with you. You know, not take it yep. in for granted, yep. but, you know, state that there's a reason that you've been there for a while. You know, that that can be useful. And again, if you can get that trust, often when someone new is taking a role, um, they've got a thousand things they need to catch up on. And those things that they can just continue without without much risk to them. You know, causing consternation can be one less thing. So sometimes if you enter those relationships well you can just kind of click it off and you'll get the yeah, rehire. Totally. If you, if you set it up, right. If you, you give you them reason to be up. concerned about it, but you know, think about it from their point of view, if you know, sometimes they come in and they're given marching orders. This is all yours. Do what you want to do. And they have an agenda and you, you need to kind of clue into that. Well, I know so-and-so was here for a long time, but it's a new, it's a new regime now. Right. Yeah. So there's that type of person. Yeah. There's also the type of person who walks into a new role and they're so overwhelmed by the amount of catch up that they have to do that they don't want to rock the boat. And so clicking things off, yeah. if it's low risk to them, is a good thing. 
That's it. And and communicating that this is low risk to them. I I remember, and then we screwed it up last summer, but um, because we had, we had some, well, we had some cancellations or whatever uh, that caused us to cancel a gig that I really hated canceling. But when a new person, uh, this woman, Rachel took over for the parks and rec department in my town and we had had, it's exactly this, you know, we'd had a long relationship. And so I just reached out to her. I'm like, Oh, okay. Reached out to this, I introduced myself, told her a little bit about who I was, because, you know, in the community, we we all sort of know each other in different ways and said, mm-hmm. you know, I'm also Dave from Fling. I'd love to get together with you and, you know, just kind of go through what you what you're thinking about. And, and you know, this exactly this. And what I didn't expect was to go to this meeting and sit down and have her like lay four dates out in front of me be like, all right, look, here's what I'm thinking about. Uh, you take your pick of all this stuff. I'd like to have you here, here, and here. It's like, oh, sweet. That's great. But it, you know, it, it works. And then of course, like I said, we had to cancel the, the biggest one of those, those things because um, I just had people falling off the list. It sucked. But anyway, uh, you can't control some of that stuff, but right. yeah, yeah, it's good. All right. So I have one more question. I know I said two, but I came up with a third one. You mentioned that Sage is a band that's leaving a hole. Um, what, what what astute listeners will pick up on is that your new drummer happens to be the old drummer and one of the founding members of Sage. Now, I that's know right. it was his brother. If I if I if I've pieced it all together correctly, it was your new drummer's brother that was the main booking contact for Sage. Is that right? That's right. So it does does your new drummer have any contacts or leverage that you can can uh, parlay into some of these gigs for you? Um, I don't know. I would assume we actually sure. haven't had that conversation. Sure. Right. So. Okay. Yeah. So he wasn't selected based upon his ability to get us more gigs. He was selected because he's a great drummer. And, sure. you know, that that's that's what I was looking. And, you know, getting gigs is not necessarily the problem right now. No, right? you don't so, have so, that problem. Right. 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 However, you know, one of the reasons that the first reason I gravitated to Russ is he's a great guy. Second reason I gravitated to Russ is he's a great drummer, but it's not lost on me that, um, Sage has created immense goodwill in this area for a long time. I have always been with the house rockers about wanting it to be, part of the fabric of our community. Yeah. And so, you know, this is why I was even in the first year that we uh, were doing this show. You talked about Sage a few times. It was, I mean, this was not a new, not a new band for me when, when it all sort of came up and you started talking about it. I was like, Oh yeah. I remember some Paul's respected this band Sage for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, and what resonates with me, and again, same thing with Joe Sherino, is that any band that's been around a long time is doing something right. Any band that's been around a long time and has this great, you know, communal feel to them, it, that's mm. respectful. If you if you play music and you mean something to your to the where you live, that to me, you know, some people are just like, tell me where to show up, I'll plug in, I'll play, and I'll play great, and I will share my art with you, and that and that's the extent of the exchange. Just personally, me something that drives me is, you know, wanting, wanting to extract, deliver, exchange meaning. And, um, you know, Sage has certainly do that. This town, I mean, I think 48 years, that band played a lot of high school graduations and a lot of birthday parties and a lot of, you know, they played a lot of things in this community over that course of time right. where their fan base, you know, they had exchanged, you know, they, they were called on to provide the music for for impactful events in people's lives for a long time. That's freaking cool to me. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, since the day I started a band, that's what I thought a band should be. And, and it should be associated with it, with your community. We play an inordinate amount of our work 25 miles around where I live. Right. Like, right. you know, it, uh, that's a great thing. Sometimes it might be a little bit overkill. And it's not, it's not intentionally that we haven't gotten more. And again, I could probably book more work if I would expand my geographic area. And I need to do that. And, you know, we do some of that. We, we have, you know, in the East Bay, about 40, 50 miles away, we have some pretty regular business. Not a lot of business in, in, uh, in San Francisco downtown. Uh, not a lot of business to the south of us in Monterey. You know, and a little bit of business on the San Francisco Peninsula, you know, not the city of San Francisco, but basically the points leading between here and San Francisco. Sure, sure. There's more to do, but I've always been so focused on, you know, 
having a presence here and building an audience here. Yeah, community so, is clearly important to you. To and, me, and I don't just me. mean if, if with the band. I mean, just like everything you that I've ever seen you do, you are at the core of it building a community of something. It, it is some way that I'm wired. I totally agree. And, yep. you know, when when to me, it's a tremendous honor if something around here has a charity and they need some help uh, and they consider us, you know, the right people. Now, again, there's people who are have or, organizations or, or causes that are they don't have much of an audience and they call us because we can bring a large audience. I'm, I'm sympathetic to those types of things, but a lot of meaning comes to me when, you know, a well-known organization around here uh, needs a needs a band uh, to provide impact, and they think we're the band that will resonate with their community. That's that's a big thing to me. So, that's huge. yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's just kind of my mindset on on community. And so you're asking about Russ, and and uh, you know that's it. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm sure there will be some goodwill that will come from this. I'm certainly not. I'm going to milk Russ for all his contacts. Right. You know, oh, no. Frank, I, Frank yeah. has been actually really cool and has reached out. And if that happens organically, cool. Um, it's not, it's not something I necessarily expect or require. Sure. Um, but I am a pretty good believer in karma that that's just something that you get with the deal. But again, yep. great well, guy, great drummer, great experience, great reputation. And that, even that if carries the, a lot. Even if the only value, and I think it would be more than this, just sort of naturally uh, in, in, in the way that it will evolve with you. Uh, but even if the only value you get out of, of that aspect of bringing him in is saying, oh, yeah. And, you know, we, we have you can use the, the name Sage when you're booking with somebody that might Worth not a lot, know about yeah. you. But you can say, oh, yeah. And our, our drummer is the former drummer with Sage. He was the, with them for 48 years or whatever. That's a really long freaking time, by the way. 48 yeah. years. Yeah. Holy crap, man. Funny, I haven't, even, I, I went I to haven't last even been gig. alive that long and I've been alive <laughs> a long time. <laughs> well, I went, I went to their last gig. They played New Year's Eve. That's what you at said this last big, time. Yeah. yeah. And um, I got a few minutes with Frank and, and uh, we were just kind of talking about it. And he was sharing that he recently found the canceled or the, or the receipt for the first gig he and Russ did. They played, they were eight years old or nine years old. They played a, um, they played a fashion show, got paid $5 each. And he said he recently, but just coincidentally pulled that out and he was looking at wow. it and, and uh, you know, but yeah, 48 years. I mean, do you know any cover bands that have been together 48 years? No. I mean, come on. That's, that's why I sort of stopped as I was saying it there. Like that's a, I, I don't know many marriages that have been together 48. I mean, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like seriously, like that's a long time to do anything. There's, let me put it this way, folks. Google hasn't been together 48 years. Apple. Apple hasn't. Apple's way, way older than Google. It hasn't been together 48 years. Right. Yeah. And yeah. The, the story is kind of cool because it's two sets of brothers that founded that founded the band. Russ and Frank were one of them. And then two of the horn players are brothers. Oh, I didn't and they've had. That. Oh, that's cool. And they. And, and they've had many long tenures in there and they, you know, they recently had a singer retire uh, a little while ago and he was an original member, I believe. And he was with them for like 10 or 20 years and left for 10 or 20 years and came back and was, you know, there close to the end. And hey, can, we so get, just, can we get Frank and or Russ on the show as, as guests to, to like dig into some of their history? I think this would be really I, interesting to hear. Yeah, yeah. Frank would love it. Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be really fun. Yeah. Cool. cool. All right, so talking about Russ, I just want to transition because now yeah. we have the wonderful task of getting Russ integrated into the house rockers. And so the, the topic of how do you get a guy, uh, you know, involved in a band that's got a couple hundred songs and, you know, what is the process by which we do it? <laughs> we started this conversation last week. And it's, yeah, it's a headache. I mean, I'm going through it's it's fascinating, right? Because I'm going through exactly the same thing. Just, you know, time shifted by six months or whatever with uh, with Uptown. Yeah. Yep. It's crazy. Yeah. So I have a, a several goals here. One is, you know, I need to get him ready for gigs that we have right in front of us. Yep. I need to get him caught up and continually adding to his repertoire of what we know. And then I need to keep the band interested. And, you know, this is the time of year where we add new music. So I kind of have those three things and I've, I've kind of been futzing over it is because luckily Russ subbed for us at the end of the summer and he's played some shows with us. And he has a baseline of content that he knows. So it'll be better than you, except for what you know, which is your, you know, the GB stuff. But sure. But Russ played a show and, you know, I have one show's worth of stuff and we're starting there. 
Yeah. I'm assuming you knew you played this. You knew it. You can brush it up and be show ready. You can, it so can happen first, again. Right. Yeah. Right. And then the whole concept of how do I spoon feed you the rest of the stuff? So he and I are constantly kind of going over the whole song list. And interestingly, I went back to Simon and Nick, who, you know, because they sing. And I said, hey, guys, this is an interesting time. Which of our catalog should we put on the on the heap? Which which what are we done playing because yeah. we're tired of it or whatever? You know, what do we not want to spend time getting rest up to speed on? And we actually pared our song list down a little bit. Uh, and it's not in the plan. You know, it's not doesn't say we can never look at it again. But as for right now, the, the plan is not to get rest up to speed on it. Right. So, so, so I will I will interject something there as the I, I mean, obviously, Russ isn't here, so I'll speak for Russ, even though I, I might ask for something he <laughs> totally doesn't want. But I'll speak for Dave in the shoes of Russ in, in this conversation. I, like what you're doing is absolutely the right thing, right? The, you have to get ready for the immediate gig. So you're, you're going to be far more focused on what's that set list going to be? How up to speed are you on these tunes? Where are the weak spots so that you as the leader, especially on stage is aware. Okay. I got to like cue this ending because he's never done that this way with us. You know, those sorts of things. Absolutely. The most important thing. And often like, especially if you're gigging even semi-regularly, that's where it stops. Right. It, it, it's it, certainly that's where the, the bulk of the thought go goes or it can. Now, you're being aware of of the remainder of this back catalog that you have. And you're you're taking the opportunity to do exactly this great thing. Right. Where you say, oh, do we want to resurrect this thing that we haven't played in a while? And, and what about that? That's great. You're going to take some of these tunes, though, and you're going to shelve them. As Russ, my request would be or as Dave and the new guy in the band would be. Give me that list anyway, because here's the reality. There's 10 of us on stage and nine of us know those tunes. So if somebody comes up, it's a special event, whatever the vibe is where somebody comes up to you and says, hey, let's play, you know, this tune and the whole band, you know, the whole band knows it, except your drummer. You're going to be tempted to say, let's try it. I would because I've been in that position and it happens. It's like, oh, yeah, mm. we know that. And then it's like, oh, crap, we don't know. Good that. idea. Right. And so I, I've been there and it's like, oh, we're going to play this. It's like, you know, there's Dave waving his hand saying, uh, somebody walk me through the, be the beginning and the ending so that, you know, we don't turn this into a train wreck. If I know that those songs are on the list, I know which ones to prioritize, obviously. But just having that list of everything else that might come up that. I am behind the eight ball on as compared to everybody else. That can be a helpful thing to have. So that's smart. Yeah. So Ru Russ is a preparation monster. He's it, really it diligent about like stuff. It. Yeah. Yeah. And so this concept of like, all right, we did our first rehearsal. So we had a lot of things in our first rehearsal because we hadn't played anything in several months. So first we just had to get the rust off, start to get rust in. So we took the set list of his last gig with us and we played the first set of that. Right. We have one new song and I'm really, you know, keeping my eye on the future. Can you tell I'm me what the song is? Yeah. It's really cool. It's okay. freaking cool. Uh, it's tears of a clown by Smokey Robinson, oh. the miracles. Mm. So the horn section pops that intro and, you know, nice. the band plays well and Russ plays the heck out of it. And uh, so we just, uh, uh, our charting guy, John, uh, brought in the horn chart because, you know, it's a rearrangement because it's not the same instrumentation. Sure. And, um, and we just do what it's called a chart check just to run the song, just to see how the chart sounds and if we like it and if we're all agreeing on the form. And so that's where we start with that. So that's what we did in the first rehearsal is we ran the first set of the show we're going to play, uh, which is the last time that he played with us as well. And then also just trying to keep the band focused, right? Yes. Is the, you know, we're introducing the news thing. So every, next rehearsal, we'll do the second set. And then the, the gig will be right after that. We'll do the second set and another run. And now this new song starts to be part of regular rehearsal until we have it down cold. And then we talk about the next new song that we need to learn. The next couple of new songs. We're we're in a little bit of a, the next song we're going to do is this 24 Karat Magic, Magic by Bruno Mars. Yep. But he did this crazy intense. The, the live version. I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, the I Grammy him, version. I saw him live. A bunch of, yeah. A bunch of parliament songs kind of like weeded into it and it just kind of yep. like that. So, you know, my memory is not good to begin with. And so those songs are really, they require a ton of woodshedding, but they require it because they're form things. Like right. it's a form, you know, there's, yeah. not too, there's not too many things that guys can't, can't handle musically, but crazy forms 
and memorizing crazy forms because they're not natural and you literally have to just wrote memorize them. Those are things that kind of get us going. So that's, that, so that's, that's coming the stuff that's like that comes natural to me. And and I instantly get frustrated when it I mean, I know that it's not it doesn't come natural to everybody. We're all wired differently. So, yeah, those are the kind of things where I have to, you know, no, <laughs> you, you you need to be the leader, not the frustrated yeah. jackass, Dave. Yep. <laughs> yep. So that's what's next. And so always trying to keep the, the new stuff coming in to get everybody's juices going. And, you know, I think that that's just a good way to run rehearsal. And then every rehearsal, we I will give Russ about five songs. So he's got a lot of work to do, but he knew he had a lot of work to do. About five more songs from from the unplayed stuff. Yeah. But even with that, there's, there's a parsing, right? So of the, let's just say 75 songs that there still are to talk about, he kind of knows some of them, yeah. you know, some of them actually decently well because his band might have played them. So there's, there's the, but he might know the, the low hanging fruit, right? That's, that's true. And that's, that's the issue. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm just trying to knock off as much stuff as I can, as quickly as I can. So if he kind of knows stuff and one of the downfalls for us is I don't have a ton of recorded shows that I could just turn over to him and say, here's the way we do it. Learn it that way. And if we did, Life would be way easier way because, easier. yeah, but I don't have too many shows that have everything that, that he needs to know. But, um, so I'm trying to move as fastly as I can getting rest stuff, but in general, it's going to be about five songs, a rehearsal of old stuff being mixed in maybe a little bit more once we get past this, that we have a basic show under our thumb and we can, you know, then move a little faster, but then I also want to get the new stuff going. So, yeah. um, no, the, the so. old stuff is definitely going to take more of a backseat than you, than you expect, unless you're mm. hyper aware of it. And that's why I said, just like giving him the list and saying, we'll come back around to this stuff, but just so you know, here's everything that's ever been played by this yeah. band. In well, the he, last has, he definitely years. has that list. Yep. 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 And you know, uh, it, it's sort of a heads up to everybody. If you're in a position where, you know that you're going to be replacing a band member, whether the band member is aware or not. Um, <laughs> it starts to make sense early before you, you know, before that person is no longer playing with you uh, to start recording your shows. And you can definitely, you, you know, just I mean, all you need is you get one of those Zoom recorders or something. You throw it out by the soundboard or, or you know, if you're doing your own sound, find a, a friendly person and just put it at their table. This doesn't need to be release quality stuff. You know, you can you can find a place in the club that's going to get the sound close enough and just record it uh, and, and just, you know, just squirrel it away uh, because it, it will be valuable. Like, I, I would love it if there was uh, recordings of these uptown shows, you know, but there's not. So it's like, yep. It's he, I was in the same boat as, as Russ. It's like, great. Yep. Yeah. And, and I remember the first couple of rehearsals, you know, they'd ask, do you know this song? Yeah. All right, let's play it. And suddenly it's like, okay, I have 14 questions about how you do this song though. It's like, Oh, yep. okay. Yeah. Right. And that, and that sort of woke everybody up. It's like, Oh yeah. Right. We can't just assume because we've all played these songs unless we want to play them like a crappy bar band and then you can just fake your way through it if everybody knows it you know but but that's not what you want to do obviously that's not what uptown wants to do so it, it's you got to like you got to learn these these breaks and the where the hits are and how the ending is so that we're not just you know fumbling through every rolling ending or whatever so it's, yep. it is important yeah yeah so one more thing for today we alluded to it Last time we got a nice email and I think we can cover it in about 10, 15 minutes, but okay. uh, we got an email from this, Dan this Ray. Like gig, gig gab extra at this point, but that's, yeah. that's great. I'm good. Yeah. Email says, gents, love the podcast. Thank you. Seriously. It made such a huge difference in my band in so many ways. We're a way more professional outfit. Thanks to what I've learned from you guys. Very cool. Of you to say, Dan, thanks. Uh, we're the clanky Lincolns from central North Carolina. I'd love to hear you guys discuss set list design, how to plan and manage the energy flow of a setter show, how to read the room, how to open a setter show, how to set up a break in a way that keeps people around. Lots to talk about here. I think it's kind of a cool, I mean, we talked about, we've talked about set lists, yeah. song selection in many ways, but this is a little bit more, I'm kind of keying into this concept about managing the energy or flow of a setter show. I think it's an interesting um, topic that's almost different than set lists. It's obviously related because the songs you choose will, will drive that. But I, I wanted to kick this off really quickly by saying there's a lot of factors that go to the, the energy flow that you're trying to create, harness, direct, take advantage of, you know, a number of things. 
I know when we play a headline gig and we're at the end of a day where people have been around all day and the energy has been, been growing often, you know, that's, that'll dictate one type of vibe. Often when we play a club date, not always, but, but fair amount of time, the club is not full on downbeat. And right. remember we're paying, we're playing, uh, you know, we play one club where we play seven thirty to 10 early yeah, and the club fills in about eight fifteen. So that, those set, but you learn that, 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 that those first couple songs, the, the, we play a lot of these civic concert series. Sometimes there's a lot of people there. Sometimes there's a lot of people there, but they very clearly have just gotten off of work. They want to have a glass of wine. They're talking to each other. They're there for the environment and the band is a part of the environment, but they're not there for the band. Yeah, maybe I mean, that's what those, I'm saying. Those nights, it's like the, the second set is the dance set. doesn't mean people yeah. can't or won't dance at some point during the first set, but that's generally not the vibe of the room. I, I mean, you got to feel the room, of course, but 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 that's certainly the way it can be. And feel the room is the key word there. It's, it's about, you got to be really honest. Uh, you know, do you know the room? That's one thing. So I, I know a lot of what we do when we play cover music is we're kind of channeling a feeling that we had when music did something to us, the way you listened into a record or when we saw a band live and you're like, yes, I want to do that. I want to make people feel that. And you, you lose a little bit of the reality of, of the environments that you're in. And this is that concept of coming out and wanting to play your best stuff first, because I'm going to blow people away. I'm going to start at 12 and, uh, and then we're going to take it to 20, you know, on a 10 point scale, yeah. because that's the experience of live music that I like. I don't care if there's only five people there. We're starting at a 12. That might not be the best thing to do. And I'll tell you, here's a really interesting way to gauge that. You now, a, there's the reality of it. I'm sure you have a lot to say about this, Dave, because it's a very common experience, but here's something that I've learned. How does your band react to it? I definitely have noticed, not so much in the last couple of years, but certainly in the early years of the House Rockers, my band gets very, would get very uncomfortable and very tight if the response wasn't happening from the downbeat. And it would affect often, at least until the audience took over and got the band cooking. But, you know, that kind of uncomfort, like, are we not going over tonight or, you know, what's going on? That feeling kind of permeates and can kind of take over a gig sometimes. Again, totally. audience, audience can solve that real quickly when they're ready to dance. Like you said, second set, you forget about that quite quickly. But I just know that as a performer and certainly as the fronter, the front person of the band, when I feel my band tight behind me, I have to decide, am I going to put my energy into getting my band amped up, even if there's only a couple people in the room or a couple people at the show? Am I going to do my performance as it was going to be? You know, you know, where, where am I, where's my energy as a leader going to be? Yep. But being very aware of how my band is reacting to a room is something that I've learned. Yeah. So with fling gigs, I build the set list and I will spend, you know, an hour for every gig, building a completely different set list from night to night. Obviously, there's some patterns that I will, uh, you know, that, that, that work and, and that I, you know, will do. But that that first five song stretch, I always plan it out very carefully and very aware of exactly what you're talking about here. Like, I need to get the band. I know that the best thing that can happen at a gig is this exchange of energy, right, between the band and the crowd that should happen all night long. What you don't know is, and what you can't control is what the crowd is bringing in. Heck, you can't even control what your band is bringing, like your bandmates are bringing in. Mm-hmm. Like you can put it on a front, but the reality is somebody might have had a crappy day, you know, you know? And so I always look at those first five tunes as, okay, can we like, especially the first three, we've got to string these together so that that reaction doesn't have time to blossom. Right. Mm. You, you know, it, it because it, it, and, and it, you know, you just got to know your band and you got to know how this works. But I know in fling like Mike, he's the one that gets really uncomfortable uh, f- the fastest. It doesn't mean we all don't, but he's the one he's sort of my metric. It's like, OK, how can I manage that? If I can do that, then everybody else is is right there. And how can I make sure that when we end the first song, Mike doesn't feel awkward and like feel like he has to ask the crowd if they can hear us or anything like that, because that's like the kiss of death. So uh, so I'm always thinking about, all right, how can I do this? We'll get Mike singing the first song that that, you know, sometimes can be the right thing because it it settles everybody in and it works. And, and you learn what works for your band. And and I'll put, you know, all, like every chunk of five songs, 
in the set list. I put that amount of thought into. And then the gig comes and sometimes I throw it all away. Uh, but I don't throw it all away because all of the thinking that I put into that is still in my head. I, if I did it either the day of the gig or usually the day before the gig. And so I have these all these thoughts sort of swimming in my head in terms of how to manage the set. And I've written the set list and sometimes we just follow it. But usually and it's often exactly when I go like we're ready to play. OK, I'm going to go pee first. I go do that. And it's that's when I think about, all right, what should the first song actually be? I know what the vibe in the room is like. I know what the vibe of the band is like. I have a lot more information than I had yesterday when I was sitting at my desk alone crafting this thing for any scenario, you, you know. And so sometimes the first song changes there. And from there, we might go into the set as written, or we might just continue calling audibles if the flow is there. But the set list is there for when the flow stops because the flow can't stop. So when I, when I am not inspired about what the next song should be, it's easy. I've got a list. I already wrote it. It's right there, <laughs> you know, uh, and that can be a really helpful thing, but you've got to feel that room out. At least that's how I do it in the moment. And a lot of times the set that you, you know, the set that I wrote or the set that you wrote is the right one to play. And, and then there you go, but be aware of what you're doing. And, the, the, the rookie mistake, and this is why I think it's really good to have a set list. The rookie mistake is to come out of the gate too soft. Like you said, Paul, you can come out too strong and blow a room away. That's bad. But equally as bad is coming out too soft because it's up to you as the band to start that exchange of energy. And if you, you know, pussyfoot your way into a room and tiptoe in there, it's not going to happen. Um, uh, you've got to put a little bit of that comfortable confidence out and just say, we're here, we're playing, we're playing for you. We're having fun. We're enjoying this. And if you communicate that, uh, some crowds, you can't get a moving at all. You know, you, it, it, like it happens. You play a club for the first time and you're like, Oh, I see. That's how this room is. Okay. Mm. But you know, but you, I, it like it has to, the spark has to start with the band. It's awesome when it doesn't have to, but I always assume that it has to. And you have to control your own, own your own destiny in these do. types of things. Totally. And the way that yeah. you do that. So is one is, you know, do you know your band? You know, does your band warm up? Does your, is your band yep. ready to go? Yep. And you know, what can you do? Um, Volume wise, energy wise, what do you want to do with the with the top of that show? Yep, harmony wise, uh, like harmony wise, uh, I, there's all of those things have to be in that first three to five song clump. That's right. Yep. And I, I just a, as an aside here, I can't say enough for warming up. Right. So as a singer, and I'll tell you, you know, when when we had Cheap Trick play yeah. for MacWorld, uh, Robin Zander goes in a room and no one is allowed in there and you can hear him doing his vocal exercises. And if, the, if, if that guy, you saw the Beatles, the, the Eagles documentary, if they do the circle of death before their gigs, <laughs> why are you as a cover band who wants to be good? Why are you not doing it? Right. right. So I, I'm a totally. big fan drummers too. I mean, I've definitely, I've played with different drummers who have been like, Oh no, I need to ease into the show. I'm like, why, why are we easing in on our, on our patrons time on your time? You know, like yeah, you should be up. ready to go yeah. warm up. Drum yeah. So uh, as a drummer, if I, if I have to like the, the worst case scenario is that I can warm up my hands by playing on my, my drum stool. Cause it doesn't make any noise or it makes very little noise. And, uh, and I can get my hands loose, uh, usually stretching or whatever is enough. You, you got to figure out for you, whatever it takes to get you to the point where you can play something, you know, technically difficult as the first tune, even yep. if your first tune isn't technically difficult, frankly, even if none of your tunes are technically difficult, get yourself to the point where you're that warm so that you can just do it. And then you can play anything with ease. No problem. And I, I found as a vocalist, as long as I sing for about 15 minutes in the car on the Definitely. way to the gig, that, yep. that personally, that doesn't necessarily sync me up with the band harmony wise or anything, but personally, that's enough. Even if it's, you know, an hour and a half between the time or even two hours between the time I arrive and the time I actually have to sing on stage, uh, I'm still warm. Like for me, that totally works. 
But absolutely, you, you vocalists can get their resonance going, you know, yeah. by humming in the car, humming along to a tune. There's vocal exercises that, that I tend to do on a drive to a, a gig. And you're right; it doesn't have to be five minutes for a gig. You can do it an hour, hour and a half before a gig, and you are technically warmed up yep. and ready to go. You're not cold for sure. Not cold. So, no. so you know, this is we're not specifically talking about a set list, but we're we are kind of talking about owning owning the responsibility of figuring out what you're going to do with your energy, you know, understanding if you know, the club is light when you start, you know, it may not mean, it does, it, you know, it probably doesn't mean don't bring your heaviest stuff. Don't play your, you know, your, your, you know, don't, don't play your best dance music in the first song. That's just common sense. But what do you want to do? You know, what do you want to do? We say Unless on the show, always is already going on. Right. Unless the crowd that's right. And that's what I'm saying. When we yeah. do like a headline gig yeah. and people have been around and it's been a day of music and there's like some anticipation build up and all we got to do is step in there and just harness that energy. Those are the greatest oh, things of all so, time. So easy. But, it, <laughs> but it's rare. You know, it, it, it's, it's occasional. Yeah. But often, you know, club I, always, dates, I always hate it when I go see, you know, a band in like, you know, whatever, in an arena or something. And it's like, man, you get to walk out on stage into a room where 10,000 people are like already going nuts. Yep. Like I hate you for that. Like I yep. got to work for this. It takes me at least 20 minutes to get people to the, like even anywhere that might be on the same scale as that it sucks. <laughs> so the, the so gig that we do at the, one of these concerts in the park that we do yeah. again, there'll be 4,000 people sitting on blankets when we start playing, it's still light out. Um, and again, a lot of people just gotten off work and they're just catching up with their families. They're having some, picnic dinner glass of wine it's not about the music quite yet that's the vibe of this particular thing they're out to be amongst their community it's not about us yet until they finish dinner and like you said the second set is usually the dance set but you know what do you do to be entertaining and to get your brand and your message and your band across so we are kind of carefully pick the songs that we put into our yeah. our pre-roll right so what are the songs that kind of set the stage uh we uh bill's great about this we have a couple songs that we use and, and when so you say if, pre-roll just so folks understand we're talking about the, the music that you're playing over you know from your ipod or you know whatever it is right. over the house system not that your band is playing but this is the the walk-in music yeah and it's at a volume of about four and then uh often in especially some of the bigger shows we have a couple songs that are walk on songs so it, you know the, the yeah. volume goes up to about a seven and it's louder or maybe an eight and uh and then these are the songs that are the, kind of the beginning of our show and if, you know if you th- don't we, have those start cranking up the you know when 10 minutes before you hit the stage just start turning up the walk-in music just yep. to get people get the energy going desensitize the energy yep that's right yep. yeah so what do you want to do with what you know is going to happen? So if it's a light room, how are you still entertaining and start to create the joy quotient that is going to be in that room for the rest of the day? Don't be a victim to whatever audience size you have. Control your destiny. Do something entertaining. Play something fun. Be funny. Be intimate. Just like, oh, you know, we're we're small in numbers to get started tonight. But those of you who are here, we are going to play our butts off for you. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to play your, your heaviest stuff. But, you know be engaged in those things, create the comfort, be an entertainer, always be performing. There it is. Yeah. And on, on the set break, you know, he had a, an interesting question. How do you manage the breaks? Um, there's a, there's a couple of things to this. One is, and I'm kind of starting backwards here, but you, you want to be aware of when people are going to start leaving the club at, at the end of the night, like people start leaving for good. You don't want to start your last set after that would start to happen. Right. So think about when you want your last set to start so that people are still there and then you'll keep them there. But breaks are, you know, if somebody's considering leaving your break is their opportunity. So you, I would love to do a whole show on breaks. I mean, there's a whole, yeah, you know, I hate breaks. I would rather play three hours straight. um, Yes, there's that. So, so think about that, but also, especially if you've got to do a three set night, my I always would rather play a longer first set so that you're not caught behind the eight ball, especially if it's just like a, a club gig or an acoustic gig where you're sort of there in the mix. But people, it's not your show. It's, you know, you're you're part of the, the thing. So managing that 
And then when it comes time for the breaks, again, be really aware of the vibe in the room. Sometimes it actually pays to take a break, you know, two songs earlier than you planned in your set list yeah. because of where you are time wise in the night. And sometimes it pays to take a break two songs later than where you thought you were in your set list. And other times, to your point, Paul, it just pays to play through all the breaks. Sometimes that just happens and it can be a wonderful thing if the energy's right in the room. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, and the band is up for it. So yeah, well, yeah what you're saying you know. is interesting. Yeah. Uh, we have one of the clubs we do, we play nine to 12. And if we take a break at 11, people will leave. Yes. And they're done. They're done for the night. Yeah. You right? have to start before 11 for that last set, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so making sure we're, we're back on. So if we start at nine and we go to 10, uh, that doesn't mean play 10 to 11 or 11, 15. It means you, you really need to get the, get the band on until about 1130. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, and even if you just take a quick five minute, but that's what's best for the venue. And that's what keeps us coming back there. So managing your time is smart. So uh, we sort ask, of answered, ask the venue what they know about yeah, the floor absolutely. of the evening, because they might actually have valuable information in terms of, of knowing the, the flow of the night, That's smart. but they also, even if they have no clue about the flow of the night, simply asking them shows that you care about their opinion and you know, they're the ones paying the bill. If they are the ones paying the bill, then so, you know, asking them shows that you're listening to them and that can, that can also get you invited back <laughs> even if right. it's the wrong so, decision. Yep. Yep. So we didn't really technically answer set list questions, but what, what we addressed was, how do, you asked about energy and you know there's some interesting thoughts about how you approach the the energy in a room what is what is given to you what do you have to create you need to own it in all in all shapes and in all forms you need to know what your band is like you as a band need to talk about you know are you warming up in your first set or are you are you ready to perform from your first song down you know th those are things that will separate you because i think yeah. a lot of bands do warm up in their first set oh nobody's there it's not a big deal well why don't you set yourself aside by being like straight on and being entertaining and giving those first early you know people there something cool do something you know we don't usually do this but since it's just since we're just getting started here tonight we got something cool we want to bring out just for you guys here and you know maybe that that's a way to make to a connection attention. for sure yeah yeah yeah, so, that's right. Oh, that's so a great idea. a lot idea. of good like thoughts. That. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. walk-in music and how you harness walk-in music. This all leads to the concept about what do you do about about owning the energy in a room, you know, yeah. knowing knowing what you are walking into. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. Well, that feels like we just did two episodes. I like it. It's good. Folks, you know where to find us, giggabpodcast.com. And if you want to join our Facebook group where a lot of folks, uh, including us, are always out there talking, that's giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. And, uh, and you know, you can email us like Dan and lots of other people. We're getting more and more email feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Paul. You said it before, but why don't you say it again? What is it we all I'll say? say it again. Always be always. performing. Thank you.